Good evening, everyone, and welcome to an inside look into the Mechanics Institute's archives and special collections with our archivist, Diane Lai. My name is Taryn Edwards, and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. Before I introduce our speaker, I just want to thank all of you for attending, especially those of you who chose to support this event by paying a little something. Now more than ever, your support counts and it helps the Institute provide more free events that help explore San Francisco's history. A word about the Institute for those of you who are unfamiliar with it. Uh, Mechanics Institute is an independent membership community founded in 1854 that houses a wonderful library the oldest, in fact, designed to serve the public in California. We are also a cultural event center and a world-renowned chess club that is the oldest in the United States. If you love old San Francisco and value activities such as this, I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It is only $120 a year, and with that, you help support our contribution to not only San Francisco's history, but its culture and its future. So our speaker tonight is my colleague, Diane Lai, who joined Mechanics in 2012 as the full-time public services librarian. Shortly thereafter, she assumed the role of archivist and worked with consultants and interns to establish an archives and special collections program here at the Institute. In the past few years, with the help of grants and donations and more volunteers, the Mechanics Institute's archives and special collections program has become a permanent part of the library and the Institute at large. Since 2019, Diane has transitioned into her role as the sole part-time archivist at the Institute. And before she steps in, I just wanted to tell you that we have a large group of registrants tonight, so we are using the webinar format of Zoom, which means that you cannot see or hear the other audience members. You'll just um, see me and Diane. Um, there will be time, however, after Diane's presentation to take questions. So as they occur to you, please put them in the chat space and we will get to them at the end. All right, thank you so much for coming and thank you, Diane. Welcome. Hello, everyone. I am thrilled to be here. Um, and let me share my screen so I can get to the presentation. Okay, there we are. Um, I am Diane Lai, as Taryn said, the archivist at the Mechanics Institute. Um, and tonight, I am going to give you a brief history of the Mechanics Institute uh, and highlight events that impacted our archival hold holdings, uh, including a sense of how the archives and special collections grew over the last 10 years, what items are collected in the archives and special collections, a glimpse at some of our treasures, and then an overview of recent projects and some of the donations we've received in the last couple of years. So this is a, a picture of our Mechanics Institute at 57 Post Street. Um, this may be the, um, the newest photo that you will see tonight. I've got a lot of pictures that I wanna share with you. So let me start with um, a little bit of the Mechanics Institute history. As Taryn said, we were founded in 1854, and mechanics institutes at that time were really um, popular in English-speaking countries such as the UK, uh, Australia, and New Zealand, and the structure of a mechanics institute was comprised of three elements. There was always a library, there was always some form of recreation, in our case it was chess and checkers at the beginning. And we offered technical or vocational classes. And in our case, we collaborated with UC Berkeley to offer our technical classes. Some of the important events that occurred in our 167 year history 
um, were that we uh, organized and ran 31 industrial exhibitions in, the, in San Francisco between 1857 and 1899. We merged with the Mercantile Library, uh, another membership library located in San Francisco in January of 1906. And then our building and our collections were all destroyed in the great earthquake in April, 1906. Uh, this picture, Uh, that I love this paper because primarily because it is cut out and pasted on this note paper. And someone has taken the time to point out where the Mechanics Institute building is on Post Street. This was the building that actually was destroyed in the 1906 earthquake. It is in the same place that our existing building is located. And it gives you a really clear view of what Post Street looked like back in 1880, as it's noted on the bottom of this picture. So we started the MI archive project. Uh, it actually started before I joined the uh, Institute in 2012 uh, and with the objective to protect and to preserve our legacy. Um, at the time, about 2010, our previous library director uh, it realized that we needed to do something uh, about protecting our historic records and organizational records and started to take steps to establish an archive. Um, our records were scattered throughout our building. It's a nine story building. And um, the picture that is on the slide kind of represents how things were stored at that time. This is a picture of the loft area in our library director's office. Um, it was kind of used as a repository for everything. Uh, and it wasn't really set up to be an archive. Um, you note that there is a large window. Um, so there is light pollution in this area. Uh, and also temperature and humidity could not be controlled in this area. We found records all over the place in closets, under printers. Um, so starting in um, about 2014, after I had joined in 2012, um, we started collecting and sorting and housing all of these items down in our basement. And uh, the previous library director had designated a part of our basement book room, which houses uh, overflow of the circulating collection. Um, and it was determined that that area in the basement was the best place in the building for an archives. Uh, it not only had security, it also had uh, no windows, and it had uh, the same temperature and relative humidity. It was constant throughout the year. Luckily, it's a dry basement and we don't have any little critters running around. So that was determined to be the best area. In 2015, we uh, hired some consultants to help us assess uh, our collections and also to help us determine what subject areas uh, would be designated as our special collections. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so this is a peek at what our archives in the basement looks like. Um, because we lost so much in the 1906 earthquake, our archives is really relatively small. Um, very little uh, survived, um, although we have over the years collected um, things like annual reports and, and such that other people had maybe in their homes that were not affected or um, uh, we have two large safes in our basement and the, the items that were located in those safes survived uh, the earthquake and fire. But really um, the good news and the, the good news is it's a relatively small archive so it's easily handled. The bad news is it's a relatively small archives. Um, our archives consists of our organizational records at the Mechanics Institute and those items are things like the Board of Trustee meeting minutes, uh, bylaws, um, historical papers correspondence. We have annual reports, industrial exhibition reports of our own personal um, 
industrial exhibitions, the library newsletters and bulletins. Uh, it, chess, we have a visitor's register from chess that is in our archives, cross tables, photos, that type of thing, and membership records. Our membership records over the years, and we only have membership records from about 1908 forward, are in many different formats. So these are a couple of our treasures from the archives. Uh, on the left-hand side is um, a large um, book, a uh, leather-covered cover volume uh, that is actually our first volume of handwritten Board of Trustee minutes. And they are minutes from 1854 to 1857. This volume was actually lost in the 1906 earthquake and fire. Um, we did not know where it was, um, but as you can see from the note, and I'm not sure if you can read the note that is next to it on the yellow note paper, this volume was returned to us in this uh, manila envelope in 1958. What happened according to this note is that um, this, it was located, this volume was located in the vicinity of the library after the earthquake. And a man had picked it up and taken it home. Um, he kept it and he had it until he and his wife both died. And they asked a friend of theirs to return it to us upon their death. So we actually got this volume back um, in 1958, according to the note. On the right-hand side of this slide is the visitor's register for the Mercantile Library. And as you remember from my brief history, uh, we merged with the Mercantile Library in January of 1906. So we had um, all of their docu documents and records uh, we had already absorbed into our, um, uh, into our organization. So this Mercantile Library Association Visitors Re Register is, was a real surprise, a surprising treasure, I should say, that I really realized that we had just this past year. I happened to be going through and um, uh, just kind of confirming what my container listings said and what was actually in each container. And I came across the register and I started looking through it carefully. And there was a note that said that, many important people had signed the register, um, such as Captain Ulysses S. Grant, uh, and that is circled in red there on um, the page. Uh, he happened to be, um, he, in 1853, he was coming through San Francisco um, as part of the 4th Infantry, and he was on his way to a fort in Northern California to take over and run the fort. And he happened to stop in the Mercantile Library and he signed this register. Um, other names that you might recognize are, uh, that signed this register are Don Jose Noriega, John C. Fremont, the Reverend Thomas Starr King, and also the author Herman Melville. I was really excited. I, it's one of the things that I love most about being an archivist is it's almost like you're a treasure hunter. And when you find something like this, it um, is very exciting and kind of makes your whole year. Um, so our special collections, we determined uh, we have seven special collections. Um, and I'm going to speak about four of them a little bit more in depth. And those are the ones that I've starred um, on this page. Uh, the other three special collections are relatively self-explanatory. Californiana and Western Americana refer to volumes that either the subject matter is about California or West, the Western United States, um, or maybe the, auth the author is from California or West, the Western United States. Um, and then membership libraries, because we are um, one of a few membership libraries, especially in the United States, although they are all over the world, we have a very small collection about membership libraries. So the first collection I want to speak about is our chess collection. Um, we have a, a very large chess collection. It is the largest uh, collection of chess monographs, newsletters, and periodicals 
um, west of the Mississippi. We are second only to the John G. White chess collection at the Cleveland Public Library. That is a wonderful chess collection if you ever have the chance to visit the Cleveland Public Library. Um, the, Deb Hunt and I, when we were out there uh, for a conference a couple of years ago, went over and visited, and it's, it's a remarkable chess collection. Uh, we have uh, in both our collect, uh, circulating and special collections, we have over 2,000 volumes um, and approximately 500 volumes are in our special collections. And our collection uh, runs from, um, it's dated from the late 1700s to the present. We, um, our, our chess director is in charge of continuing to buy items for our chess collection. We are particular, particularly strong um, in chess periodicals. As you can see uh, on the far right side of your screen is the British Chess Magazine. And we have the full run of that from 1881 to the present. Uh, and that is continues to be published. Um, on the far left of the screen is the chess volume um, titled, entitled Chess by Richard Twiss. And that was published in 1787. And then I've included a couple of other uh, items that you might find in our chess collection on the slide. Other chess periodicals that we have are American Chess Bulletin, Chess Review, Chess Life, um, but we have many, many chess periodicals. Also in our collection are photos, many photos, uh, chess pieces, um, and other ephemera, cross tables, et cetera. The next special collection I want to talk about is um, industrial exhibitions and world's fairs. Because we held our own industrial exhibitions, um, we planned them, we ran them, um, it, uh, our board of trustees did this all voluntarily, and we we had our own industrial exhibitions primarily to um, to make money to run our institute. Um, but because we had our own, our some work board of trustee members and other members of the institute would go out on their own and go to these industrial exhibitions and world's fairs not only nationally, but internationally, and bring back items, uh, booklets and pamphlets and things like that, that we could use as ideas for our own industrial exhibitions. Um, we have a large collection of uh, items from the Panama Pacific International Exhibition, which took place here in San Francisco in 1915, partly due to the fact that our board of trustee president at the time and our secretary, I believe, they both um, were on the board of the PPIE. And so they had access to a lot of these items. Uh, we have mostly pamphlets and booklets, but also maps and correspondence, um, a lot of items. So we have 200, about 200 items for the PPIE. The Golden Gate International Exhibition, which took place on Treasure Island in 1939, we have about 100 items. Um, again, it was a local um, fair, so it was easy for people to attend and bring back items for our collection. And then the California Midwinter International Exposition in 1894, which took place in Golden Gate Park, um, we have a small collection of items from that fair. Uh, this particular uh, leather bound volume is uh, a history of the fair. Um, but other than that, we have a few um, pamphlets and booklets and things like that. As I said, these were very um, popular industrial exhibitions and world's fairs all over the world during the 19th century. So we have uh, kind of a smattering of items from other uh, world's fairs and expositions, including, but not limited to, uh, the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. That's a view book on the bottom of the slide there from that fair. The Crystal Palace Exhibition in London in 1851. 
the Hudson Fulton celebration in New York in 1909, the New York World's Fair in 1939, the Exposition Universelle in Paris in 1867, and the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in 1904. Um, a small uh, special collection that we have um, is uh, our Aryan Press collection. The Aryan Press is a small printing establishment located in the Presidio here in San Francisco. It is still publishing works. Um, it primarily is a 20th century kind of um, publishing company, but it continues in the 21st century to also publish. They publish fine press limited edition uh, books with original art. Uh, we have a few more than 75 volumes. Um, and the reason we have this uh, collection is because uh, one of our members donated the entire collection to us. Um, the, the type in these books is handset. The paper might be handmade. Slip covers are uh, to protect the volumes are unique, always unique, and they're made in in-house. And I've just kind of uh, included on this slide as some examples of Aryan Press books. So on our far left is The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, and above the title page are the paw print is on the cover of the book. And then next to it is the slip cover for the volume. And it's a little hard to see, but it is a misty field. And way in the back are trees behind the mist. Um, and then in the middle, we have a Christmas carol. And the fezzy wigs are dancing on the cover of the book. And then the red is the slip cover for the, for the book. And then I, I've included a shelf of uh, one of the shelves of Aryan Press volumes that we have in our special collections area. There are, I didn't include any of the very oddly shaped ones. There are some round books that are in almost like um, a film can. Uh, there are large volumes. We have a two volume Bible. Uh, so they're all interesting and, and this is truly word as art. Um, but they're beautiful books, and we're very lucky that they were donated to us. And finally, the last special collection I want to speak about is the Civil War collection that we have. And this is kind of an unlikely special collection uh, to have at the Mechanics Institute in San Francisco, and not many people know that we have it. Um, we have approximately 250 volumes in this special collection. I've included on this slide just uh, a sampling of the books that we have in the special collection. And the reason that we have this special collection, again, is because it was donated by two of our members uh, who donated their personal collections of this, of their the Civil War collections that they had. Um, I particular, when, when I started pulling items that I thought I wanted to include on this slide, I, I think I want to read some of these. I haven't really sat down and read them all, um, but Life and Death in Rebel Prisons and uh, the report on the Fort Pillow Massacre, I've never heard of some of these things. And so um, I will probably pull them and, and sit down and read some of these. And I hope that other people will know about this special collection and do the same thing. So now I'd like to speak a little bit about some of our projects that have happened over the last five years or so as we've built our archives and special collections. And one of the first things we did was to replace this um, metal and wood uh, cabinet that we have on our, in our second floor library with a, an archival display cabinet, which you'll see on your right. Um, it was uh, intended specifically to exhibit our items from our special collections and our archives. Um, and hanging above it is one of our treasures. Um, it is an 1854 Bridgens map. 
that was based on the 1853 survey map of San Francisco drawn by Richard Bridgens. Uh, uh, the Mechanics Institute acquired it in 1859, um, and it's noted for the vignettes that are on the border uh, of the map, and they're vignettes of San Francisco landmarks and architecture in San Francisco. It is only one of a handful of these maps still in existence today, uh, and it is uh, remarkable for its pristine condition. There is um, a bit of a water stain on one corner of it. Uh, we believe that is probably because it was folded up and it was in one of the um, safes in our basement. So it, it actually ex um, made it through the earthquake and fire with a little bit of water damage on it, but it's in very, very good condition. And anyone that can should come and take a look at the map. It's a, a remarkable treasure of ours. Also in 2016, we started a big digitization um, project. And we started with digitizing our historic meeting minutes from the Board of Trustees meetings. Uh, we have nine volumes of these historic meeting minutes from 1854 to 1923. This happens to be um, our very first volume. And this is the volume that, if you recall from um, earlier in the presentation, had been damaged in the earthquake and fire and, and returned to us in 1958. Um, this is what it looks like inside. And as you can see, it's very faded uh, and hard to read. There is um, down here um, along the spine, you can see the water damage that occurred. Um, so we decided we would start with our uh, historic meeting minutes because they're unique. They are about our history and they're fragile. And as you can see with the fading of the handwriting, the, the fading ink, um, we felt that it was better to start with these, the sooner the better to get them digitized um, uh, and, and then safely secured, uh, the original safely secured in our archives. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit more about this further in, in the presentation. We also digitized our chess room visitors register, which was in use between 1913 and 2014. Um, it wasn't religiously used, so there are gaps um, within the uh, visitors register, but we have con um, signatures of many notable chess players in this register, including um, US champions, world champions, um, Frank Marshall, Alexander Alekhine, Mikhail Tall, A.J. Fink, Walter Lovegrove, Imre Koenig, uh, George Koltanowski, and Boris Spassky, um, just to name a few. And then in 2017, we continued our digitization project by digitizing uh, the Mechanics Institute's industrial exhibition reports. These reports were written after each of our industrial exhibitions. Um, and we have almost a full run of these. We are missing the final, uh, the report for the final industrial exhibition. And they did not write a report, a full report for the third industrial exhibition because it didn't go well and they didn't make very much money. We know that because someone kindly wrote a note about this and why they hadn't produced a report. Um, so at least we know we're not just missing that report. One of the most frequent research questions that we get from the general public is about someone that they are researching who exhibited something at one of our industrial exhibitions. And they want to know, did, did this person exhibit there, what did they exhibit, and to give them as much information as possible. Unfortunately, these reports um, really only give you an, a, 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 maybe a title, or as, if it's an artwork, it's the title of the artwork, or, um, or 
it they produced some kind of flower or something that they exhibited. Um, there were many different subject areas, and so <clears throat> um, it could be they, you know, it, they were some they exhibited something, and they just wanted to know what it was, and just kind of. Um, confirmation that they did exhibit and when. And that's about as much as we can tell them. We do have a few photos from these industrial exhibitions, but the reports are really all we have left of that. Uh, in 2018, we actually had to go in and modify our basement archives area um, a, a little bit after after storing things, you know, after we went through the collecting and sorting and organizing and storing, um, putting things into boxes, et cetera, we discovered that uh, regular bookshelves are way too narrow for our boxes. Uh, and so we had to slightly modify our basement archives area by installing uh, deeper shelves that could handle the boxes that we um, have on them. We also added grids on some of our walls so that we could store framed images um, on those grids. And we also put in flat files um, that handle uh, and, and store large format uh, items such as these photographs that you see in this picture, um, atlases, blueprints. We have a lot of blueprints um, and it's primarily blueprints of our uh, building, um, posters, anything that is large format and flat are, gets stored in these flat files. Almost immediately after we installed these, they were full. Uh, it just gives you an idea of how much of that type of thing uh, we have in our archive. More recent uh, digitization projects, um, in, starting in 2018, we joined um, and became a member of the California Revealed Project. And this is a project that is handled out of the California State Library. And the benefit of this one is that they will digitize items for us for free, which is kind of a big deal for us. Um, the, the catch is that it has to be a California-based uh, item and it has to be unique. So in 2018-2019, um, with the help of the uh, former chess director, we selected um, six California chess clubs or associations um, that had a run of newsletters that was important to uh, chess in California. And we um, sent those all up to the California State Library and they digitized them. And once those are digitized, then the California Revealed Project uploads those into the Internet Archive um, to WorldCat, Calisphere, and the Digital Public Library of America. Um, I have a selection on this slide of three of those associations. And the reason I selected them, at least for two of these, is uh, the Chess Voice one has Paul Whitehead on the cover. Uh, as a Cal Northern California champion. And then the California Chess Journal actually has Nick DeFermian also winning a championship. And both of these gentlemen are current chess club employees at the Mechanics Institute. Um, and then the chess reporter, I just like the image. So we had um, primarily full runs of these newsletters for, um, for Chess Voice, California Chess Journal, the Chess Reporter, Chess in Action, um, let's see, Scotchick Voice, I have the California, and California Chess News are the ones that were digitized in the 2018-2019 project. Uh, in 2019, 2020, we sent them 74 photos, uh, his, historic photos of the Mechanics Institute. Uh, because of the pandemic, this kind of got stalled. So I'm still waiting for those to be uploaded, uh, to be digitized and uploaded and returned to us. Uh, but the pictures that I actually have on the slide show 
our new building and new being the building that was uh, built after the 1906 earthquake that we currently occupy. And these photos were taken in 1915, just before we reopened this new building. Um, some of our members that are with us tonight will recognize the tables and the chairs because we are still using a lot of those tables and chairs. Uh, from the left-hand uh, picture, that is the third floor library, which has had some changes to it since 1915. The middle picture is our chess club and it looks remarkably similar to our chess club today. And then on the right-hand side is our second floor library, which also has had some major changes to it since 1915. Although the tables and the chairs look very much alike, um, uh, very much the same because we are still using those. Uh, I mourn the loss of some of these beautiful light fixtures. I keep hoping that I'm gonna open up a closet and find them someday, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so one of the projects that I worked on during the pandemic um, and that we recently um, completed is the addition of an archives and special collections webpage on our Mechanics Institute website. And I'm going to take us out of this and show you this webpage because, so here we are and we're on the webpage. Uh, and to get here, you would go to the Mechanics Institute website and then go to books and more and hover over that and drop down to research and there's the archives and special collection page. And that's where we are right now. And this, uh, for those of you that are interested, it gives a much more detailed description of what is in all of our um, archives. And uh, let me just scroll down to the bottom here, what is in our special collections. Um, and, and please, if you are interested, go, go on down there and take a look um, in its uh, gives you a much more detailed description of what is in that we have. But what I want to point out is that our digitized holdings, our industrial exhibition reports, which you can see are all listed there, our board of trustee minutes are all listed there, and our chess room visitors register are there. But these are direct links to our digitized holdings. So let me just show you. So let's click on volume seven of the board of trustee minutes. And hopefully this will take us over to the Internet Archive where these are stored. There we are. So you can see the Internet Archive. And so it shows you, um, that's the, of course, the book cover. And you can kind of just flip through it. So as you can see, they're a little hard to read, um, but you can you can make it larger and then you can zoom in as far as you need to go in order to read it. And you can manipulate the page so that you can actually go in and read. Um, we are, we, so we, as I said before, we have uh, digitized the uh, nine volumes of the Board of Trustee Minutes, all of the uh, reports for the industrial exhibitions and the chess register, and those are all available on, um, on the archives and special collections website. Um, so please take some time and go and look through those. We are, I'm busy uh, ha having worked from home so much the past year, I've been doing a lot of other scanning and I hope to get some of our other records up on this website as well. Okay, so let me go back, oops, to this actually. There we go. Okay. Um, and what we are also doing is, and this is a project that has been ongoing for a couple of years, uh, we have been starting to transcribe those handwritten historic board of trustee meeting minutes. Um, 
I've just kind of taken a screenshot of uh, the September 11th, 1855 handwritten uh, Board of Trustee meeting minutes. And then next to it, to the right, are, is, is um, uh, our transcription of what is handwritten to the left. This is a long labor intensive type of project. Um, we've only gotten this as far as we have because of our wonderful volunteers and interns. Uh, and we uh, have completed the transcription of the first volume of meeting minutes and partially we've completed the second and third volumes. And this is going to be an ongoing project. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about some donations that have come in in just the past couple of years. The Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco um, over during the pandemic have been kind of culling through their collections. And I think um, they, they have, they sent us early or I guess mid 2020, a list of items that they thought we might be interested in. Uh, they had some kind of connection to the Mechanics Institute. And so we've taken a look at them and we uh, accepted some of them. We have to be somewhat uh, picky or selective because we only have a certain amount of space. But uh, some of the items that they have donated to us are true treasures and we are so thrilled that they offered them to us. This is a portrait of John Syme. John was one of the founding members of the Mechanics Institute. He was on our board of trustees for many, many years, and he was the board of trustees president from 1857 to 1858. And they sent us this wonderful portrait of him. Um, I love, I love the beard. Uh, another item, uh, other items that they donated to us were 12 medals from uh, various of our Mechanics Institute in industrial exhibitions. Uh, we handed these out to kind of best in class of um, the people who exhibited at our industrial exhibitions that you either there were gold, silver or bronze medals. The ones that they gave us are dated between 1857 and 1891, which and we are thrilled to have them. We had already 22 medals in our archive and to add 12 more is truly remarkable. Um, a picture that came again from the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco this year is a portrait of John Hugh MacDonald, who was a Board of Trustee member uh, in 1873 and 1874. And this donation actually came from a private donor who contacted our chess director and wanted to know if we would be interested in this handwritten score sheet from 1924. This is a, this was a tournament, uh, a chess club tournament between Alexander Alekine and Fisker, but I'm not sure what his uh, first name is. Um, and of course we were thrilled to have it. And when I went back and I looked at our chess club register, sure enough, Alexander Alekine had signed our chess room register on February 27th, 1924. And finally, we were contacted earlier this year by one of our members, who's a chief land surveyor for the San Francisco City's Public Works. And he wanted to know if we would be interested uh, in this precision survey level uh, for a long-term loan. Um, and the reason why it's special to us is that um, the A. Leeds Manufacturing Company actually was one of our tenants in our commercial space in our building from 1916 to 1936, approximately there. Um, they also exhibited at some of our industrial exhibitions. So we are thrilled to be able to have this on loan and it will be exhibited in one of our display cases um, soon, as soon as, uh, you know, we open up a little bit more to our members and the public. 
And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to have had all of you hear about our archives and special collections. Well, thank you, Diane. Um, we are ready to take your questions. I see that there are a few here. Um, the first one was from Florence, and I did put some details in the chat space about this, but maybe you could comment as well, Diane. She asks, are the archives made available to researchers? Um, they, yes, they are made available. Um, you, uh, the researchers and uh, our members and public really can't uh, access it in the basement, but if a researcher calls me and makes an appointment and tells me what they're looking for, I'm more than happy to do a little, you know, do some research, find items that might uh, be of interest to them, and then make an appointment to have them come in and and see the items in the library. They would be in library only. Um, and then just a word about the pandemic restrictions. Right now, we're just open to mechanics members, but soon. Correct. Correct. <laughs> um, I have been doing some research over the phone, and if it's something that I can scan and send, I'm happy to do that. So if it's if it's a smaller, you know, manageable size, then that that can work as well. Great. And then Carol asks, are items in the special collections, such as rare chess magazines, consulted by mechanics members, or is the idea to preserve them rather than make them necessarily available to readers? Um, we do have uh, some of our members who are um, voracious users of our special collections. Um, uh, they tend to be chess aficionado kind of people. Um, we are preserving them for the future, but we encourage, we want to encourage people to, to look at these items. Again, special collections would be in library use only, but um, we are, that's one of the reasons we're trying to digitize so much is that uh, people can access it from anywhere. Um, we have actually been working on digitizing some of the chess periodicals, and those are available on the Internet Archive. Great. And then Maggie asks, do you have any history or artifacts on the Mechanics Pavilion in the collection? We do have some on the pavilion. Um, I, I know that we have um, listings of events that took place at the Mechanics Pavilion. Um, we have some images of the Mechanics Pavilion, not a lot, but yes, we do have some. And we actually now, for we, uh, and, and actually Taryn, you can probably answer this even better than I can, but we had different pavilions. I'm assuming they're talking about the last pavilion that we had that burned up in the earthquake and fire. But for our industrial exhibitions, we constructed pavilions and we had seven or eight of them throughout the years for just for the industrial exhibitions. And we do have images of those. Um, so yes, we would have some information Probably not lots and lots, but we would have some, depending on what the specific question is. Yeah, so a, a time period would be best if you are inquiring because there were several mechanics pavilions. So um, just let us know what year. <laughs> <laughs> um, Carol has another question. Do you now have every item in the archives identified and cataloged? Every photo? No. We do not. That is a huge project. And um, since there's only one of me, and while I have used interns um, a lot, um, we I have container listings, but those not necessarily cataloged. So I can find things, but no, you are not going to be able to find everything in the catalog, in our catalog. And Maggie asked another question. Uh, regarding the pavilions, she asked because one of her 
ancestors attended a ball there in the late 1800s. And I just wanted to comment that um, events that were held at the mechanics pavilions over the years were heavily covered by newspapers. And so I'm gonna put in the chat space, um, a, data, a free database that uh, has newspapers that you, know, you can search for mechanics pavilion uh, and find articles related to the events held there. Yes, and, and if there is something specific, if you have a specific date or a spe specific range of dates, I can probably go and, and, um, and see what we have about the pavilion at that point in time. All right, any other questions? Steve comments, great resources and preservation projects. Thank you very much. Lots of thank yous rolling in. So, uh, we appreciate it. <laughs> great. Well, I had a fun time putting this together, and um, and I hope everyone enjoyed all of the images that I, I showed during the presentation. Yeah, I certainly did. Um, all right. Well, I don't see any other questions, but tons of thank yous. So I just want to announce that the um, video for this event will be emailed to you, um, the link to it, uh, and the video will reside on the Mechanics Institute's YouTube channel, so you can refer to it later if you like. Um, and I just want to thank all of you for coming out tonight, and thank you, Diane. Sure. My pleasure. All right. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye.